for having me. Thank you, Ken, for inviting me. Uh, it's great to be here. It's my first time in Rutgers, and I see some familiar faces, uh, which is great. Uh, so I'm going to talk about, uh, as, as Ken mentioned, my work on computer music, uh, in which I take a very linguistic approach, since that's what I do. We were joking at breakfast. If you if you carry a, a sledgehammer around with you, you use it to solve all problems. That's what I do with programming languages. Uh, but anyway, uh, this work uh, has been a lot of fun for me the last few years, and I think it is something that relates well to students, and I'm trying to connect it into the educational context. So, in a way, this talk is a, a test of that sort of idea, since I'm not assuming that you know lots about detailed uh, programming language work. But my, my goal is to combine my research with this kind of fun area. Um, and in that sense, there are really uh, two um, subtitles to this talk. Uh, one is how to have fun combining your hobby with your work. Uh, I love music. I play jazz piano. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm accomplished, but I, I do it and I have fun doing it. And wow, wouldn't it be great to take your hobby and combine it with your research? And that's what I've been trying to do. The other way uh, to look at it is to flip it around and say, okay, you're doing research, uh, how can you make your work relevant? So, uh, so using an application area to help motivate the primary research is really a great idea. So when you take your cool, advanced, abstract ideas and start using them in the real world, then certain things don't work or certain new uh, requirements arise and you start developing new programming language ideas to solve those problems. So it's been a motivation for us to do more research. It was uh, just as uh, satisfying. So the context of this, why did I get into this though? Uh, the thing that sort of was the, the real motivator in just the past few years is something that we call C2, if you know, which stands for Creative Consilience of Computing and the Arts. So I and two of my colleagues in computer science at Yale, uh, Julie Dorsey and Holly Rushmeyer, uh, created this program and designed a major, an undergraduate major, in computing in the arts, uh, which has specialized tracks. You can read them there, but you'll notice that one of those is music, and that's the track that I'm responsible for. So we created this major, uh, worked really hard to work with these other departments to figure out what the curriculum is for each of them and so forth. And then, of course, I was responsible for the music track, so I had to teach computer music. So uh, I became responsible for teaching a two-term sequence, actually, in computer music. And rather than just, you know, say, use some commercial software, and, you know, the, the truth is there are lots of languages out there for computer music, so why design another one? Well, because I wanted to use my language and my ideas, so I did. This was a great context to do that, uh, and, and that's what we've been doing. There's also a graduate program, which is less focused specifically on the uh, art side, but I do have uh, graduate students who are you know, doing their work in the context of music, as do Julie and Colin. So, been a lot of fun. And, and then, of course, the bottom line is how do we get the PL research to fit into all of this? So there are two things I need to tell you before going too much further. One is where did this name Euterpia come from? It actually comes from Euterpe, which is the, uh, one of the nine Greek muses who were uh, the goddesses of the arts. And uh, Euterpe was the uh, muse of music. And that's a, uh, an imagined picture of what the, the goddess might look like. And the other thing I need to tell you about is Haskell. Some of you um, might know about Haskell, especially if you talk to Ken too much. Um, you'll pervert your mind in all sorts of ways, but this is one of them, perhaps. Um, so Haskell is a pure functional programming language. It's really the only pure functional programming language that's in use today. And I was involved in the design of it in the very beginning. And it has lots of cool, advanced programming language ideas. And so, uh, in fact, that's one of the fun things about teaching this 
this, these computer music courses is I'm, in addition to teaching computer music, I'm teaching advanced programming language ideas. So uh, Euterpia is built on top of Haskell, uh, but it has, in certain uh, ways, kind of the look and feel of something that's a little bit different from Haskell, which I'll uh, tell you about uh, in a minute. So, um, so right. These are, I've kind of already mentioned these ideas. Why am I doing this? I have this course I need to teach. I want to use advanced ideas, language ideas in a fun area, combine my research with my hobby, and so forth. The interesting thing about uh, the people who have taken my courses is that since the computing and the arts major is actually uh, pretty young, this is only the second year that it's in existence, last semester, um, of the 24 students in my class, only five were actually in the computing and the arts majors. The others were undergraduates and graduate students who were interested in either learning about computer music or learning about these advanced programming languages uh, ideas. Now, uh, this last bullet I saved for last because it's probably the most <coughs> contentious uh, goal here, if you will, is that <coughs> ultimately, it would be great if artists actually use these ideas to create art. And um, much in the same way uh, Bauman is trying to get people to use his tools to, to create art. It's not just about the mathematics, it's not just about um, the computer science, it's also to actually try to do something that's creative, interesting, and, and useful. So, can we do this? I don't know. Um, the three ways in functional programming can help artists. Abstract and abstract and abstract. That's um, my theory on all this. And if you talk to artists, of course, they talk about abstraction all the time, right? Perhaps in a different way than we think of abstraction, but I like to point that out anyway. Uh, and I think that many of the tools that we provide for normal applications in functional programming can be useful to artists. Uh, but, you know, monads for artists, who knows? Will this pay off in the long run? In that sense, who knows? But we'll find out. So what I'm going to do is demonstrate Euterpia by example. So normally when I used to give early versions of this talk, I would start, okay, well here's the, the, the fundamental stuff, the little bits and pieces, and, and build up to larger and larger things. I'm going to do something different today, which is basically to, since you Euterpia at this point is a, is a pretty large system, and, and I don't mean large in just terms of line of code, in terms of its breadth of coverage of computer music concepts. <clears throat> then what I want to do is take a few of those concepts and just show you the code, and trust that I can somehow explain it to you, even though I haven't showed you how the bits and pieces fit together. So don't be too startled by some of the code you see. It's not necessary to understand every bit of it. I'm really just trying to demonstrate the breadth and give you the general feel for, for what uh, we're doing. So here's a simple example. And um, I'm assuming, or at least hoping, that you can read a simple score such as the one above. And one way to read that score is to say, well, there are two lines or two voices, one that goes C, D, E, F, G, F, E, D, C, and the other one uh, third above it in the C major scale. And and so, how do we describe that in Euterpia? So this is just a very basic thing to get us started. Uh, we go much further than all this, but you'll see some of that in a minute. So we could say then that the, can you see my little pointer? I don't know if it works right now. Um, so this, the first note is a C. Well, that's great, but what C is it? So uh, in most computer music systems, <coughs> you give the octave that that C is in. So the C in the middle register of the uh, piano uh, is the fourth octave in Euterpia. And then this QM just says what its duration is. It's a quarter note, right? So we have um, C in the fourth octave is a quarter note. And then this little guy says, OK, play that followed by. And now we have D, because uh, that's the next note, also in the fourth octave. And it's a quarter note, followed by E, followed by F and so forth. Then we take all of those guys and we play them in parallel with, and that's this 
what this constructor here does, with the analogous thing that starts at E. We have E, F, G, A, B, A, G, F. And I'm only doing the first four bars here for simplicity. So, very simple, verbose, you could argue, but accurate. Uh, and the question is, can we do better? So this is just an example to show where the pedagogy comes in. We can use simple musical examples rather than, you know, Fibonacci sequence or factorial or something to demonstrate, you know, basic ideas of, say, abstraction in computer science. And to do so using some advanced ideas like Toyota functions, which I'll show you in a second. So this top, these top four lines are the same four lines I just had on the previous slide. Um, and then you can say, okay, well, let's first do a data abstraction, which is to say that um, we have all of the, this sort of domain-specific operator that's connecting these nodes together. Um, why don't we just take those nodes and put them into a data structure first? and then convert the data structure into that musical uh, value. So this little square bracket is a list. It's just a sequence of values. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, and, and here they are. So we have C, D, E, F, G. And separated by comma, which isn't an operator. It's just a separator. Okay, so we have um, then this data structure, which is just all of these notes. And then we're applying this function line to it, which I haven't told you about, but just believe me that what it does is it takes a list of notes and converts it actually into this musical value, which is the sequence of notes um, put together in, in the right way. And we play that in parallel with line applied to this other list of notes. Very simple. So we thought, okay, that's at least one form of data abstraction you might do. And then we say, okay, but we have all these um, repeating four QNs everywhere, right? And the whole idea in abstraction is to look for repeating things, pull those repeating things out, put it in one spot so that you're not repeating things everywhere, right? And there's lots of arguments for why that's a good thing. So um, that's called functional abstraction. And so what we do is um, we use now a little high order function sort of thing <coughs> on the map. Uh, again, you don't need to learn the details, but the idea of, of this Fn, this function Fn, is that given a node, it <coughs> supplies this information, the 4 and the Qn, but it does it in one place. And then that function Fn is mapped across this entire list of nodes. So now we have something that's more abstract, right? More compact, more succinct, but clear also in the sense that these four QNs are just um, settled into one spot, and we can more clearly see the structure of the, of the music. And then we can even go one step further, um, which is to use, which we notice that this line map FN, line map FN, is again a repeated thing, and we can abstract that out into something. Called GN using higher order functions, and the details again are important. But you end up with something that's pretty succinct. Now, ultimately, what you'd like to do when you're composing music is sort of write this kind of stuff directly without the, the very detailed thing that, that you begin with. But as part of the learning process, you start with the verbose thing and you see um, another way to do it. So, um, next part of the pedagogy is. Okay, that's great, but how do we know that those transformations to the code that we did are actually correct? Now, in, in most languages, and this is a, you know the standard argument you'll hear from functional programmers all the time, is it's really hard to do these things in an imperative language. It's really easy to do these things in, in a functional language, and we just use what we call equational reasoning or proof by calculation, which is really no more than high school algebra. It's just substituting equals for equals, um, and it works out very cleanly. So if I tell you that we have these three axioms, which is that line applied to this list gives me this, and that map Fn applied to this list of values gives me this, and that this uh, is just the definition of function composition, which is this little dot operator, just with those three axioms, I can prove everything that was on the previous page. And it actually is a valid 
mathematical proof that is a proof of the correctness of the program. So it's program verification, which these days is a um, important, fairly important thing. And novices, as I said, can grab this easily. It's not difficult. And eventually, um, we can reveal that, in fact, uh, functions like line and math are actually recursive functions. And they have uh, a recursive definition whose validity, the validity of each of these axioms can then be proved using uh, uh, in induction on these uh, recursive definitions. But that can come later. So, banality introduced another thing. This is again, now this is pedagogy, but now in a slightly different level, more at the meta level, which is the following point, which is that if I actually go back to, sorry, this example, and you look at that score for a second, the other way, th this interpretation of things is called the contrapuntal interpretation because you think of two lines that are uh, interacting with each other. The other way to think of it, though, is, is, is polyphonically, which is that really I have a chord, it's just a, a dichord, two notes, followed by two other notes, followed by two other notes. So why didn't I write it that way? Well, I could. So here's a simple example revisited. So now I'm going to do a polyphonic interpretation. And so now you see I have a C and an E played together, followed by a D and an F played together, and so forth. So why not write it that way? OK, we could. Uh, and it likewise can be simplified. And I won't go through the details, but you end up with something like this. So you have just pairs of notes, and there's some function that's combining them in parallel in the appropriate way, sticking in the fours and the QNs, and, and so forth. So it's very simple, very straightforward. But my main reason for showing you this alternative way of, uh, do it, of expressing this example is that as Haskell values, or as values in any language, uh, they're not equal. This version that I showed you is not equal to the other one. So that axiomatic reasoning that I showed you two slides ago won't work here because they're not, we're not now reasoning at the level of the language, values equal in the language. We're reasoning at a meta level or an interpretation of the program. So this notion of equivalence is different from the language's notion of equivalence. So what do we do? Well, what is the intuition here? The point is that no matter how I interpret it, whether polyphonically or contrapuntally, they sound the same. If I were to play this, I would hear the same notes. I would hear the same sounds, say, coming out of the speaker. And so the interpretation of the music or of these values is the same. So we need to come up with some formal uh, notion of interpretation performance. So let's do that. Let's say that a performance is a sequence of events. And an event, which I write like this, event T-I-P-V-D, simply is a way to say that at time t, instrument i sounds the pitch p for duration d with volume d. Okay, now I haven't actually in the previous example showed you uh, volume, but imagine that you could add that in here. But in any case, this is what an event is. And then we just say that a, uh, that, sorry, that a performance is a sequence of such events. So when I finally play the music, I get this sequence of events. And since I have this time t, in a sense, I don't have to even order them. But you can imagine they're ordered. And that certain notes might happen exactly, certain events might happen at exactly the same time, and so forth. But in any case, that's an interpretation. And the point is that no matter how I interpret those two previous versions of that example, I should get the same performance. OK, so. So here we have, then, now let's imagine details, I know many, that there's a function perform that given some context, and the context just says, OK, what key are we playing this in, and what instrument are we using, uh, and what time of day do you want to start the performance, or whatever. Um, that given a, a context and a music value, 
of the kind I've shown you previously, that it generates a performance. And then we simply define the notion of equivalence. We say that two music values, M1 and M2, are equivalent, which we write like this, if and only if, for all possible contexts, if we perform one, we get the same performance as if we perform the other. In other words, if two things sound the same, they are the same. The cracks like the duck. And so here's an example. Um, we have this constructor here, takes two musical values, combines them, and then combines them with the third, whereas this thing does it slightly differently. That's associativity, right? So this theorem cannot be proven at the level of Haskell values, because as values, these actually aren't equivalent. But I'm using this symbol here, which says that, in fact, they are equivalent. So this is an axiom at the level of this um, um, interpretation. So that's cool. In fact, it turns out you can develop a complete algebra of music. And by complete, I really mean technically complete. So in fact, there are eight axioms. If you take that one on the previous slide as one example, here are, uh, you know, another example is that the parallel composition operator is not only associative, but it's also commutative. You work through this and uh, think about what things should be equivalent. You can come up with an algebra of music that consists of eight axioms. Probably the most complex and, and subtle but very important axiom is what I call the duality of these two operators, which says that suppose that M0 um, and M2 have the same duration, these two guys. If these have the same duration, then if I play this followed by this in parallel with this followed by this, then that's the same as playing M0 and M2 in parallel followed by M1 and M3 in parallel. If you think about it or if you actually draw it out, it makes a lot of sense. Um, with that axiom, so now you have these eight axioms, you can prove that they're sound, and to prove they're sound, you just go back to the definition of what uh, equivalence is, but you can also show that they're complete. So that if you have two pieces of music that actually do sound the same, in other words, their performances are identical, then with just these eight axioms, you can prove that, in fact, they're equivalent, which is what completion is all about. So why am I going to all this? Because this for me, is another kind of pedagogy. This is about model theory. This is about unitational semantics in programming languages. It's all about interpretation of things and the notions of interpretation in this case, and what amounts to an algebraic semantics that captures that interpretation. Yeah. So, two music what is equivalent. I mean, do you mean score-wise, or because you can play it with a different tempo, right? I mean, so that's well, not, that's. That is surprising. I mean, that's the strongest. I mean. So this context captures like the the tempo. Mm -hmm. So this says for all C. So I'm using the same C here, here, here. So if you perform these two things using the same tempo, using the same instrument, um, one instrument or multiple? Well, no, it could, it could be multiple instruments. So you, again, this is the simple version of things. You can within a composition to have as many instruments as you want. But if you choose the same set of instruments and play this description of music versus this description, if you get the same thing, they sound the same, then they're equivalent. So, uh, sorry, so this set of axioms, is it homomorphic or somehow isomorphic to any other algebra? I mean, is this like something which like a, a exists a lot? for a ring or yeah, something? Yeah, yeah. Exactly. It, it's not that I know of. Mm. I don't know of an algebra that's that large, actually, that has eight axioms. The closest thing that comes to it is an axiomatization of lists in, that comes out of functional programming, but it's not quite the same. And um, but let me point out one other thing, that this is actually more general than I even described. And um, it's something that in the more general context I call polymorphic temporal media. So any media that has these temporal properties um, for instance, video clips, you know, um, 
and, and those sorts of things, or, or sound tracks rather than notes and things. If you use the same operators and whatever, they all have, they all fall under this same algebra. So, um, so again, the, the detail that I went through it quickly, but my main point is there's some interesting pedagogy here that can be done in the context of music and that it's just totally analogous to what we do in a more technical field. So I didn't do this, just want you to know. Um, somebody went on to cafepress.com and put this nice t-shirt together. Pascal is what I used to call Utopia before I started calling it Utopia. Um, and this little subscript here, um, you can't read it, says fun facts and functional programming. Anyway, um, new topic. So this is now, so I'm going to move away from that sort of pedagogical stuff and now move into actually some hopefully interesting applications of some of this. Yeah? yeah. Before you change, just to start a new topic, uh, something occurred to me. Are the eight axioms of uh, whatever it is, temporal PTM, whatever they are, yes. Uh, what other applications besides performance media might they have? Uh, for example, would they be helpful in understanding the way windows appear in a uh, in, in a uh, on a screen? Well, maybe. Yeah, um, that, that's performance art in a, of a different kind. Yeah. So it, it works for for video clips. So if you're taking videos and splicing them together and overlapping them and whatever. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. I haven't thought about that. Maybe we can talk afterwards. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so my question was, uh, the language you describe is for finally the output is a performance, right? But is it also possible to describe rules for improvisation? Rules for optimization? For improvisation. Improvisation. So you have some basic rules, but within that you can vary. Right, so in, instead of improvisation, let me make it simpler. Um, interpretation at the level of, say, dynamics and you know that kind of stuff. Mm -hmm. Probably not. So I actually call this a literal interpretation because it's fairly simplistic. But you know, if if you and I each play some you know Bach fugue or something, I'm going to play it differently than you. So our performances are different. So in that sense, they're not literal, because if they were truly literal, then they would sound exactly the same. So I really can't get into that level of uh, detail. We had this discussion at breakfast this morning. Uh, so that's a limitation. So, so the context is always static? So the context was controlled speed and... Well, that's just the initial context, right? Mm -hmm. So that's the initial context. Then the score could, within it, change the tempo But the initial condition, which is like saying that the initial, when you're interpreting a program, you have to say what's in the memory. Okay. So it's the initial condition. You know, another possible avenue is the DJ music, the mixing, you know, what is it called? Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah. the current trend. I wonder how that would apply. Yeah. Well, that's, that's, yeah. that's functional. I mean, double, I mean you mix right. different sounds. And yeah. My son does it, you know, performs uh, with, you know, and stuff. Right, right. Um, interesting. I'll think about that one too. So, all right, so I should go on. Um, I'm actually worried about getting everything in, but I'll do my best. Which isn't meant to say don't or, or stop asking questions, but anyway. Um, so let me talk about self-similar music. So this is an idea that um, that uh, Bauman will relate to because it relates to fractals and things like that. But I'm going to give you kind of an intuitive notion of what I mean by self-similar using. It's just it's an example of a fractal. Um, but I think actually technically you may tell me that that's not true. But anyway, let's here's the idea, a very simple idea. We start with a simple melody of n notes, some number of notes. Okay, and now what we're going to do is duplicate that melody n times, so that and we're going to duplicate them and play them one after the other. But those those clones, if you will, are going to be changed slightly. Is that then the same n? Or 
No, no, no. Oh, yeah. Sorry. No. It has nothing to do with. Uh, well, I won't. I won't that. No, it's just and it's for some number n of nodes. Yes, but I mean, like in the second line, you said duplicate that. Number. Yes, yes. So you, you looked at how. The, sorry. Yes. If you have n nodes, you duplicate it n times, and then each of the clones is transformed based on the based on the corresponding node in the original C. And that that transformation does this. It transposes the i melody, melody proportionally to the pitch of the i note in the original pattern. Um, and then you scale its tempo proportionally to the duration of the i note. And then you do it again and again and again. So you potentially have this infinite um, thing you could look off in. So at some level, you have an infinitely dense melody of infinitesimally shorter notes if all of your durations are initially actually shorter than one. So um, to, to render this, to play it, uh, what we do is we stop the process at some level. Just like, say, with fractals, you can, you can look closer and closer at an image and keep expanding um, in the step. But to actually play this, then we want to do Thing. So here's a simple example, three notes, C, E, D, the uh, middle note is an eighth note, the others are quarter notes, and then we duplicate it three times, so we have these three notes, these three, and these three, and you can see the transformations, in particular notice that these three are each one half of the duration of that, because that middle note was an eighth note, and that's one half quarter note, and it's shifted up a third, because that's a uh, third, and so forth. And then you do it again, and you do it infinitely often, and you can think of this as a tree. So each of these is a node, and it has three children, and so forth, and so each of these guys has more children, and now just imagine it, you create this thing. So how do we do this? Well, we could write an inductive mathematical definition of what that means. It wouldn't be too hard. But, it's, but we might as well do it in Euterpia. And the point of that is that Euterpia is concise enough that you can describe these things pretty much as you would write the mathematics. And so um, the first thing we do is just define, we're going to build a tree. So we define the data type, call it what I'm calling here a cluster. And a cluster consists of an, um, of an S node and a list of clusters. So an S node is just a node. But it's a simple note. All it has is duration and absolute pitch. And by absolute pitch now, I just mean an integer rather than attaching an octave to it. So middle C might be the 47th note, right, and so forth. So a very simple note. And for each of those, then we have uh, a um, subtrees, uh, which is a list of notes. This is actually called a rose tree in data structure literature. And that's it. So that's just a, to define the data type. And then, basically, these four lines of code right here describe that infinite tree. Now, one of the nice things about Haskell and Euterpia is that it's a lazy evaluated language. So you can actually just build this infinite tree and not worry about it you know, running out of memory or anything. Because in a lazy language, you only actually construct that part of the tree that you use. Okay? So here's, this is an infinite tree, and it looks, of, you know, you could argue like the mathematics. So let me give you an example. Um, we have this thing called make plus, which builds one of these trees. So here's the node. And then for every P, every node P that's in the original pattern, what we're going to do is do this transformation called add mall to, uh, to this node. Okay? And AdMol does what I described earlier. It multiplies the duration and it adds the pitches. Okay. So um, again, details are important. The main thing is to say that this is a very concise definition. You know, for every P in the original pattern, we construct a cluster um, based on that P, and then this is the definition of how the cluster works. And then this guy, all it does is it descends a certain level into the tree and skims off the notes and plays them. Okay? Or it doesn't play it, it just returns them as a list. Okay? Again, the details are important, but um, 
it's not very hard, you know, functional program. So very quickly, so we can write that code and then let the students kind of go crazy with this. It was a totally simple thing that I did for this talk. Let's take this four note C, B, C, F, G, okay, and we're gonna plug it into this tree, which means just applying the function to that sequence. Traverse four levels, so we apply that little fringe guy to level four. Uh, and then the result we're going to call M. And then what the students have fun doing is just doing crazy things. So this is saying, let's take M, the thing we just created, and let's reverse it, transpose it down an octave, 12 semitones, and play it with itself. So we take M, we play it with itself, but re in reverse and down um, an octave. So let me just play that for you, just to give you, a, again, a simple idea of, of what we can do. Add one other thing, 
which is to say that while well, signals aren't quite enough because they really we really do click the mouse now and then or, or touch something on the keyboard, we also need a notion of event. But the other way to think about events is that it's still a signal. It's just most of the time there isn't anything there. And occasionally it wakes up and says, oh, there's something here. Right? So we we merge the two ideas so that an event here is really just a signal of what we call a maybe type, which means that maybe there's something there and maybe there's not. Usually there's nothing, but occasionally there's there is something. And similarly, we can think of uh, another um, output as being MIDI messages, so that you have a stream of MIDI messages. You know, assuming people know what MIDI is, that's just the, the little sound card on your computer it takes MIDI messages to play certain instruments and so forth. So, um, what I'm going to do is skip that and give you now an example of using this in the context of computer music. And this is an example of um, chaos. So look, we have this simple recurrence here. Xn plus 1 is R times Xn times 1 minus Xn. Um, this is one of the classic ex examples that you'll find in chaos theory. And the idea is that depending on the value of R, that recurrence, the way I like to think of it, this description here is how it's often described in chaos theory. But the way I like to think of it is that equation has a solution, a unique solution, in for certain values of R. In some, for certain values of R, it actually has two solutions. And certain values of R will have four solutions. And at some point, it actually starts moving into what's called a chaotic region. And so what we want to do is use this to generate music. And there was actually, I you know, can't remember his name, who 10 or 15 years ago kind of made a mark by composing music using this idea and that uh, exact um, equation. There's a lot of code here. I don't want to um, uh, go over it in detail. But I'm going to go back to this example just for a minute. The main point is that there's a certain section of the code that is simply this pure function that is taking, um, here we are creating a slider. So we have this thing AP. And just think of AP now as this signal. It's just a time varying result. So what we want to do is give MIDI out some pure purely functional uh, variation of this signal, which is described in this one line. Details are important. We're doing the same thing here. Um, I apologize. It's probably way too much uh, to explain. But the idea is that we are building a couple of widgets that generate the R value and that generate a pulse, which is timer that says how fast we're going to generate notes, and then uses those, in, again, in a pure way to uh, generate the output notes. So what I'm going to do is show you that. So what I'm first going to do is change the frequency to make it quicker. And then this growth rate is that R parameter. So as I change it, it settles in on a fixed point. If you still have one solution. Now suddenly we have two solutions. Back to one. Two. 
Oops. Oh. <laughs> I don't know what just happened. I guess our code is not totally robust. Sorry. I wanted to get to the point where there's chaos. show you that stuff, besides showing you, I, I'm not sure I was convinced that it's actually really easy to write GUI programs in this data flow style. But the other reason to show that to you is that the other part, the other major area of computer music research is down at the sound level, down at the signal processing sound synthesis level. And so what you're trying to do is now generate the 44,100 samples per second that you find on your CD, the actual sound that's coming out of the speaker, rather than high-level musical structures and notes and, and you know, self-similar music and so forth. So the idea is then to take this signal metaphor and use it at that level, and to write now programs that generate sound. When I say, said earlier I teach two courses in computer music, one is about all that high level stuff, the other is all about this sound level stuff. The key idea here is the notion of the signal function. If you think of that data flow metaphor, you're wiring boxes together. Those boxes are signal functions in the sense that they convert one signal into another signal. Okay? So here's the key insight. There's that box. In order to get that data flow uh, concept, in Euterpia, we write it like this. So we put in x into some sig button and get out y. This particular syntax is called arrow syntax in Haskell, which I'm not going to get into at all. But it's an abstract computational idea that works extremely well in this context. For example, one of the things we do is we build, instead of saying, OK, I'm going to take samples of a flute sound or whatever and store them and that's going to be my flute sound or, or that I generate one particular kind of a sine wave or whatever that and I'm saying that's my flute. What you could do instead is actually model the physical properties of the flute. So for example, when you, if you have a flute and you blow into it, so you're, you, you have a particular embouchure that blows the air in a particular way, then you have two chambers um, you have a, the left part, and then the right part, and as you change your fingers, you change the length of that bore. So that's this uh, flute bore delay, embouchure delay, um, and you literally model that as a waveguide. So you have this delay line where the signals resonate inside of this, this cavity. You model the breath as a random source of noise. You put filters of various sorts, low-pass filters and whatever, to deal with the propagation of the sound out of the flute. Um, you, you, you use a sine wave at the top there to simulate vibrato of the, of the breath. And so you're modulating the, the, uh, the breath with this vibrato. And then these line say things are just envelopes. So it says when you first play the note, you, you ramp up, and then you tail off, and so forth. This is the nonlinear component that deals with the breath, which is a sort of a chaotic um, or these nonlinear uh, thing that goes on uh, in the embouchure. And you wire together, and notice that there's feedback. So this guy comes here, and it feeds back in two places, one there and one here. It's fairly simple. The question is, how would you program this? 
how would you plug this up? Well, the point is, using that data flow metaphor, it's actually pretty easy. So here's the actual flute model, um, except for the parameters on the line settings, the envelopes, which aren't even shown on this figure anyway. This piece of code is isomorphic to the diagram that I just showed you. So here are our delay lines, for example. Here is the, the nonlinear um, breadth. Uh, it's completely recursive, this rec keyword, so we have that, um, um, that x is defined in terms of x, and so forth. Um, very simple, very elegant um, description. And then we can come up with um, some examples. So we can change then with these various parameters, we can get different effects. So this is a demonstration of the change in the breadth parameter. The second one being breathier than the first one. Does that sound like a flute? It's not too bad. For that simple model, I think it's actually pretty good. Um, if we don't provide enough breath at all, we won't even get a, a sound or tone. Listen. hear that? Um, and here's an increasing. And then we can put it all together. Not too bad. Okay, let me say one other thing, and then I'll play one final thing, which is that another way that, that our research comes into this is at this level, how do we make this stuff actually go fast? So when we write you know, this code with all these high-level abstractions and arrows and all this stuff, you know, how slow does it make it? Um, it turns out that it actually makes it faster. And one of the main reasons is that um, in this data flow context, we've actually discovered a particular kind of arrow that we call causal commutative arrow details are important, but these two points are important. We can take any one of these programs, okay, and we can normalize it into an expression that is, you know, like in that one example, we actually had nested loops. Um, um, it will take any arbitrary size program and, and, and collapse it into a single loop with one vector of state variable. So that eliminates all the intermediate data structures, all the complications synchronizing the loops and, and so forth makes it very easy to implement and we get, um, you know, we can get typically or often at least two orders of magnitude improvement in the performance that we can actually then use this down at the byte level, 44,000 and 100 cycles per second uh, and do it in real time for moderately complex instruments, which is pretty cool. So, um, final two slides, uh, what are we doing with all this? Well, I'm trying to do two things. One is give my students uh, cool ideas and cool tools to work with and go crazy with doing some fun things in music, whether it be a robotic conductor or trying to figure out what a saxophone, the size of a house sounds like, or to create some new exotic instrument that does crazy things new forms of artistic uh, expression in general and so forth. And in computer science, as I mentioned, it's motivating a lot of uh, work that we're doing. So like the, the CCA stuff, we're now trying to figure out um, how to parallelize all this. If you can actually um, create this single loop in this uh, vector of state variables, it gives you a real handle on mapping this, say, onto a multi-core architecture and taking advantage of the parallelism in, in modern uh, machines. So we are having lots of fun, and let me give you uh, an example. So this is a, uh, a composition done by one of my grad students, Donnie Quick. Uh, it was done entirely in Euterpia, and it demonstrates lots of different things. There's both high-level stuff in terms of the structural things and also things I haven't told you about, like support for microtonal compositions. So you can 
field of arbitrary scales, for instance, in 2D Utopia, as well as low level signal processing. She actually did this because she was entering a composition, um, sorry, a competition where the, the theme was the sound had to be of bottles of some sort, whether knocking on a bottle uh, or blowing on a bottle. Um, and uses various other ideas. So I'll just play a few minutes, or less than that, actually, of this for you. having trouble with the bass. The bass sound is actually a blown bottle, just a very large bottle.
planes based on little examples. It would seem to be interesting to be able to build more complex systems and using your language. Yeah, absolutely. That actually, in some sense, test out their theories by the viewer of a critical musician. Yeah, right. We should do that. Or somebody should do that. Mm -hmm. um, yes? The, um, the food sound was really amazing. So, so I don't have a sense, though, not explaining this stuff. Is that close to the state of the art? What is the state of the art? How does it, how do you even judge these sorts of things? Right. Um, well, the judgment is ultimately, you know, the, the listener's discretion, right? So, um, the discerning ear of the, the audience. Um, Yamaha makes a series of uh, physical modeling-based synthesizers where they have, you know, built hardware to, uh, to do this stuff. One of the hardest things to create a convincing sound of is reed instruments and horns. Uh, violins are easy, pianos even aren't very hard. Piano, in a way, is another kind of string instrument. Like, so if, when you have these uh, instruments that have a pretty uniform overtone series and, and, and uncomplicated uh, attack and decay issues, um, you can do pretty well. But with, with, say, a reed instrument like a saxophone, it's, it's, it's pretty hard. Um, but So they work hard at building these physical models models of these things in order to get something that is, is realistic. And nowadays, there are these things called electronic wind instruments. Um, they're completely electronic. Um, what's his name? David Brecker plays one quite a bit. And they sound pretty good. Um, but a lot of this stuff is not even necessarily real time. You could say, OK, I'm not interested in real time. I'm willing to spend hours and hours to render one second of the very best sound you know, amazing stuff, as they do in the movie industry when they're rendering, say, animations. Um, and you just do everything completely offline. So I don't know what the state of the art is. I think there's, you know, certainly far more than just the flute model that I gave you. But it's pretty amazing that that pretty simple model does, I think it is, and I think you agree, that it does as well as it does. And you could certainly do better. Could you maybe uh, contrast both speed and functionality with like C sound, which is probably the grandfather of all systems out there. Right? Yeah, this is it's so much easier to work with this than C sound. Um, but C sound is there, so there's two parts to C sound. One is the note stuff, the um, so-called um, score files, and that's very primitive. It's more like low-level MIDI, and all of the first half of my talk, all that stuff I showed you goes way beyond any of that. The actual, then what they call the orchestra files, which generate the sound in C sound, the instruments, okay, um, is actually pretty functional and it has this kind of data flow feel to it, although it's in a Baroque uh, syntax. But it has some very rough comparative edges. So if you want to do delay lines, for example, uh, it, it gets very ugly very quickly. Um, but we actually use C sound as a lot of our motivation. Um, and, and yeah, I don't mean to put it down completely because C sound is, is, is actually great. And it's probably the most widely used uh, computer music system. Yeah. So, the, just to follow up, uh, when you played the model symphony at the, at the end, was that being generated real time from your. No, that wasn't real time. That was. Yeah. What level had you stored? You stored the audio? The actual, that was just an audio file that you played? Or was yes, that was just an audio file. file. Right, so we generate like a WAV file. To right. and how long did it take to generate that? I don't know. I didn't ask. Um, good question. I'm not sure. So, how much can you do real time? I mean, the flute was real time, right? Yeah, what, what I just played for you was not real time, yeah. but that flute model is easily, you could probably play at least 10 such flutes real time under our current system. Um, so, you know, we can do the kind of stuff with, you know, on my laptop that Yamaha was doing in their build, building into their uh, synthesizers now. Part of that is just because machines have gotten faster and faster. <laughs> um, and part of it is, you know, we're doing, I think, some pretty aggressive optimizations. In terms of performance, we match up with C-Sound, for example. Um, 
Actually, oh, the 50 pattern. times faster was within your system. Part. Yeah, uh, yet uh, 50 times faster. Right. Uh, kind of things was within your system. Yeah, that was. And that's a retrospective thing, or, something like or that. introspective thing, right. not compared to C sound. Um, right. It just makes the Haskell or Utopia programs run that much faster when you turn this optimization on. demonstrate this, that for beginners, the visual intuition is really helpful and um, allows them to very quickly write programs. But experienced programmers find the visual tools to be really limiting because it's just really hard to move code around, to modularize things. Uh, you know, by the time you're dragging and dropping and wiring up things, you could write uh, a few characters in your in your code, and so experienced programmers um, tend not to use the visual stuff. So, um, but I've often wondered, you know, wouldn't it be nice to at least have, say, a visualization tool? So you say if you have, if they really are isomorphic, as I claim, then you should be able to go between the two pretty easily. Right? And to have some tool that automatically did that, maybe at one moment in time, you'd like to be doing visual things, and then you could say, oh, okay, I'm tired of that, I don't want to make real code. Um, but if they really are equivalent, there should be a way to do that. But that's, a, that's a pretty big engineering effort. And we have right, and it seems to me that you're also designing this to actually create uh, the UI in the process of the program. At least that's what you showed with your slide. It's like you said, yes. you see that you have the functionality inside of your program that will actually expose parameters to the outside world, yeah. using this, which is in the design of the, of the, of the, of the program, I guess. Right. So in fact, there's a computer music uh, environment called Max. Does anyone know Max? Yeah, that's what I was Which is a great, great little language. But it, it also, I mean, at night, students, they take my class, they take the Max classes in the music department. Um, and even then, after just you know a year of taking each, realize that Max is really limited. At first, it's like, wow, I can wire this stuff together. I find that Max gets extremely complicated for the most mundane tasks. Yeah. I'm wondering if there's a way that, I mean, it seems that you might have found a smaller set of commands that does the same thing. Well, and that's, that's so the hope. Max I have patches are just, are, are just crazy large graphs. Yes, right. It gets very tedious. And that's what I was trying to say earlier, to organize, to reorganize it, to move code around, separate things in different modules, it just becomes pretty horrible, um, difficult to do. And then you tend not to do it, so you're just stuck with this giant morass of wires. So, um, but it, it, it might be worth looking at that more closely. I just, you know, these are intuitions mostly that I'm giving. So, uh, I was wondering if you could say a few more words about how this fits into the rest of the curriculum. Like, um, you know, you talk about the music for example, you know, people, you know, how, how do people react, how students and you know, maybe other people with each other? So people in computing and the arts, our, our uh, curriculum is, is pretty rigorous. So the, um, the students, before they take these computer music classes, have it, you know, they've already done, you know, the intro courses and the data structures and whatever. So they're, they're pretty good programmers already. They understand algorithms and so forth. Um, and, and they, they adapt to this pretty quickly. They um, take it on pretty quickly. The, 
the people who struggle are the people who are more musicians, to be honest. But they struggle with computer science concepts in general, I think. Um, so occasionally I'll get a student who wants to learn this stuff who's not really in the computing and the arts major. They're more of a musician. They got turned on by Mac, say, and they want to learn more, and they try to jump in at this level. And I say they, it's really, I'm just I'm thinking of one person in particular. And it hasn't, hasn't worked out particularly well. Um, to, just to say one thing about functional programming in general, you, as some of you know, um, a lot of schools, especially in Europe, use functional programming at the introductory level for many years. And, and it said, this is how you should start to program using functional programming. And I used to think, that's really a great idea. Yeah, let's, let's do that. I now actually think that's a really bad idea. <laughs> because um, what happens is, um, you, you teach them all these elegant concepts, but it almost seems like a toy. And then they get to learn about C or Java or whatever, and they realize they can actually do side effects, and they actually get excited about side effects <laughs> and turn their backs to functional programming and say that purity stuff. Why were we doing that? Whereas my opinion is it's only after you program for a while you understand the, the consequences of software engineering and those issues that you actually appreciate the ideas of purity and high order functions and modularity and abstraction. What do all those things mean to a beginner? You know? And so I actually think now <laughs> that we had it all backwards for all those years and it's better to teach it later. But this is a very contentious point. We can go have lunch and <laughs> talk about it. Yeah, how would you do some interesting stuff with just like self generated music? I'm sorry, with with uh, like either like some music you create yourself. Right. Like, like, like as far as music, just musicians like spitting stuff in as input and um, speaking playing around with it. Like is that something that you guys explore a lot or is that something I yeah. or yeah, that's something that like some people in the music uh, department there or like yeah, that's something students look at much or Yeah, so I'm I'm confused. You mean just to Compose to compose? Well, 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 no, like, Sorry. actually composing your own thing and then having and tweaking around that composition that you've created. Uh... Sure, we do that all the time. Um, yeah, I do that some. I, I <laughs> tend to get wrapped up in building the tools, and I want to do more of that. Um, but my students do it a lot, and, uh, and I intend to do more of it in, in the future. Um, and I'm hoping that Again, musicians will, will do that, right? That musicians will just look at this as a tool. No, they don't care about causal commutative arrows or whatever. They just want to create some beautiful music. Um, I don't know if I answered your question or if I understood it <laughs> properly. So, I, mean, I guess a related question. It seems like to, to help that process, you probably want something where musicians who know a lot about music can sort of work with their instruments or some other yeah. easier way of generating kind of the, some of the, the pieces they want to work with right. than right. C4 and, you know. Or yeah, yeah, yeah. Or right. So I did, you know, some of the widgets that we have, we have little keyboards. You can tap on the keyboard. Um, and we have MIDI in as well as MIDI out. So you can take a MIDI, a real keyboard instead of a virtual keyboard and hook it up to your turf. Um, but to be honest, it's actually a, a fair point. We haven't done that well enough. We haven't done the engineering to make that uh, a seamless way to get musicians more quickly involved. Um, we, we need to do more work in that area. Did you also do any research on, on alternative means kind of following up on alternative path interfaces for, for interfacing interfacing with such music software systems? Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of stuff like this multi-touch the more thing. I think yeah, I, I'm actually very interested in that kind of stuff. Or, you know, to take an iPad and drag your finger across the screen and make music. Or um, there's actually, I'll tell you one quick story. There's a guy, his name's um, Bob Rober at Yale. He's an applied physicist. And his research, his research area is golf, as in golf. He teaches a course on the physics of golf. He writes papers on the physics of golf. This is basically a double pendulum. You've got your arms and you've got your wrists and, and the timing. So anyway, <laughs> the point of that is, how does that relate? The point of that is one of the cool things he did is he developed this device that goes into the shaft 
of a golf club. And it measures the rotational and translational motion in the club. And he converts it into music. <laughs> Basically a simple chord that changes in volume and in pitch. Okay? And uses that as like biofeedback to improve your golf swing. And it, apparently it works amazingly well. Like VJ Singh uses this thing and claims it's like the best thing ever. So why am I mentioning that? Because we were sitting in his living room one night and he showed me the device and he handed it to me and I'm just like going like this and realizing that I'm doing music. So I thought, wow, what we should really do is take these things and strap them to people's legs. Rebecca, you can relate to this, and arms and just do an entire choreography, the dance, where you know the, the body motions are actually generating the, own, the, 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 the dancer's own accompaniment, if you will. Wouldn't that be cool? I, yeah, I think that would be fun to do stuff like that. It gives a whole new meaning to, to the phrase sweet spot. <laughs> right, that's right. That's what you're looking for, it makes this sweet music. <laughs> so we're having fun. Was the, the bottle of court on the bottle of orchestra, was that composed traditionally? Or was, that, or was there like algorithmic components to that? Or they were taking there was a little bit of algorithmic stuff. Um, you might have noticed there was some microtonal stuff, um, which was, I think it was a fractal algorithm that generated that. Um, but also you probably noticed there was a lot of conventional structure to it, which I think she just programmed. So that the high runner was used as like embellishments on a composed piece? Right, right, and, and that's what I would expect an artist to do, just like a, a graphics artist, some, someone who uses amazing graphical tools, computer tools for doing art, uses them in artful ways. You don't push a button and out comes a, a, a masterpiece. It's a, it's a tool. So I'm, I'm not that naive to think that we're just going to generate amazing compositions by pushing a button. Well, just, some people do that. It, it reminded me of the demo scene where you, you uh, generate graphics and music and animation uh, almost completely on good uh -huh. It's a competition to see who can fit it in the smallest you know, assembly program. Oh, really? Yeah. And so almost everything is algorithmically generated. Oh, uh, interesting. Textures. But people spend a lot of time writing those small programs. Yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, so uh, uh, if you're interested, uh, please join us for lunch. Um, and actually, also, not lunch, uh, people in my seminar, please talk to Joe. Uh, okay. That's the same speaker.